Hello, everybody. Today we are starting the nervous system. So, brand new system today. The nervous system is a system that is all about control. The nervous system is going to control cells, it is going to control organs, it is going to control tissues. The nervous system is one of your major control systems in your body. And it is not alone in being a control system. I say that because your endocrine system is also going to control cells, tissues, and organs. So what we want to do first of all is just kind of contrast these two systems and then we'll go into deep detail about the nervous system. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, the nervous system and endocrine system are both involved in control, but how they achieve that control and the effects that they exert are going to be different. So the nervous system is going to communicate with electrical signals and with chemical signals. The nervous system uses electrical signals and we'll learn about two of those types. The types of electrical signals we'll learn about are these guys called graded potentials and these other ones called action potentials. The nervous system also uses chemical signals and the chemical signals are called neurotransmitters. Now, this is in contrast to the endocrine system, which is going to solely rely on chemical signals, known as hormones, and these hormones, they always travel in the blood. Okay, so the method of communication, the method of signaling cells and thereby tissues and organs is going to differ. What's also going to differ is the timing. The nervous system is going to have speed on its side. It's fast. Endocrine system is slower. I mean, think about it. The nervous system uses electricity to communicate from one part of your body to another. And we know electricity is going to move rapidly. The endocrine system sticks hormones into your blood, and those things have to travel. So like, for example, let's say your pancreas made a hormone. That hormone from the pancreas is going to travel through your veins back to your heart, from your heart to your lungs, from your lungs to your heart, then from your heart out to the rest of the body. So there is a delay there. However, you may be wondering, well, what's the endocrine system, what's the upside of the endocrine system? Well, the endocrine system, oftentimes its effects are going to be long-lasting, while the effects of the nervous system are more short-lived. So these are just a couple of the differences. We've met some endocrine hormones already this semester. Can you think of some? When we talked about bone, we talked about growth hormone, testosterone, estrogen, calcitonin, parathyroid hormone. Kind of a lot already. And we'll do more hormones throughout AMP1 and AMP2. But for now, for right now, we are about to begin our journey through the nervous system. The nervous system has three jobs. All right, and they're kind of depicted in this image here. One of those jobs is to take information to the brain, okay, or to the spinal cord. So that job is called sensory input. So one of the jobs of the central nervous system is to take information in. And that's called sensory input. The next job, and this next job will happen either in your brain or down in your spinal cord. And that next job is to process that information. And our word for the processing of information that your central nervous system does is integration. And then the last job is to take commands from the brain, the spinal cord, out to your organs, your tissues, and your cells. And that is called motor output. So we take information in, sensory input, we process that information, integration, then we send commands out, motor output. 
those are the three basic jobs of the central of the nervous system. Okay, I keep wanting to say central nervous system. We'll get to that in a second. Because here it is, in fact. The central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are the two big divisions of your nervous system. The central nervous system is your brain, and here's an inferior view of the brain right here, and your spinal cord. So your brain, whoopsie, so your brain, there we go, your brain and your spinal cord are the two parts of your central nervous system. The other big division of the nervous system is your peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is basically everything outside of the central nervous system. So everything outside the dorsal body cavity. If you were wondering what DBC stood for right here, it's dorsal body cavity. So everything outside the dorsal body cavity is the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. Now, basically what that means is we've got nerves. Nerves are in your peripheral nervous system. There are nerves coming out of the brain. I see lots of them here. These are all nerves coming out of the brain here. And these are called cranial nerves, the nerves that come out of the brain. Then also we got spinal nerves, which are coming out of the spinal cord. So cranial nerves out of the brain, spinal nerves out of the cord. Those are the components of your peripheral nervous system. So we take that nervous system, we chunk it up into two parts. The CNS, which is your brain and spinal cord, and then the PNS, which is all your nerves, your cranial and spinal nerves. Everything outside the brain and spinal cord, in other words. Okay, now we actually do some more divisions. We're going to take that peripheral nervous system and have two divisions of it. There is a sensory afferent division, and the job of that sensory afferent division is to bring information into the CNS. Remember, sensory input, that was one of our big jobs of the nervous system. Now, there's another division called the motor efferent division, and that job is in that division, the job of that division, there we go, is to take commands from the central nervous system out to the tissues, organs, and cells. Now, you probably remember these words afferent and efferent from when we were doing homeostasis and the basic homeostatic feedback loop. Afferent means carry towards, so it's carrying towards what? Carrying towards the CNS. Efferent means carry away from. Carrying away from what? Away from the CNS. Think about the word same. Sensory, afferent, motor, efferent. So sensory is afferent, motor is efferent. Okay, on that beautiful note, let's talk a little bit more. There's actually another anatomical consideration we have to think about when we're talking about our spinal cord. This is a section of the spinal cord right here. This, this whole thing right here that I am going to encircle is the spinal cord. What kind of section do you think this is? You think it's longitudinal? You think it's coronal, frontal, mid-sagittal, parasagittal? It's none of those. What is it? It is a transverse section. And when we look at a transverse section of the spinal cord, we can actually see how information goes in and out. And what I want to point out to you is that your sensory information always comes in on the back side. This is the back or the dorsal side of your spinal cord. Your sensory information always comes in on the back side. Your motor commands always leave on the ventral side the front of the spinal cord. So there is an anatomical consideration to the way information, to the way these divisions get in and out of your cord. So remember, in our PNS, we have a sensory 
afferent division, and that sensory afferent division is always dorsal. So sensory afferent dorsal, sad, like this little guy here. The motor efferent division is going to come out of your spinal cord ventrally. And this will come back to haunt us later on, so I want to introduce this topic while we had it. Okay, so we got our peripheral nervous system, everything outside the spinal cord. Central nervous system was brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous system, everything outside that. Peripheral nervous system had two divisions, sensory afferent and motor efferent. And in terms of the spinal cord, the sensory afferent information always comes in dorsally. The motor efferent commands always leave ventrally. Okay. The same thing doesn't apply to the cranial nerves coming out of the brain. You don't get to have that nice anatomical distinction of dorsal versus ventral. But that's okay. And we'll talk more about these nerves later on. All right, we're now going to do some more division. The motor efferent division. So remember, we had a sensory afferent and also a motor efferent. The motor efferent division has two branches. There is one called the somatic nervous system, and then one called the autonomic nervous system. Somatic means of the body. The word soma literally means body. So somatic means of the body. And the somatic nervous system controls your skeletal muscle. So all the muscles you see here on this muscular individual... These are skeletal muscles, and skeletal muscles, of course, move your body. Now, this division of your nervous system is mostly voluntary. It is mostly voluntary. So, motor efferent has two divisions, somatic and autonomic. We just covered somatic. It controls skeletal muscle. It is mostly voluntary. The word somatic makes sense because somatic means of the body, and skeletal muscles, of course, move your body. The autonomic nervous system. The auto, word autonomic means it is means like governed by itself. So you don't control your autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system is going to control cardiac muscle, like what you have in the wall of your heart, and smooth muscle, like what you have in your blood vessels, in your urinary bladder, in your airways, and this is all involuntary. So, let's backtrack for a second here. In our nervous system, we got central and peripheral. Central is the brain spinal cord, peripheral is all the nerves outside that. In the peripheral, we got sensory afferent, bringing information into the brain and cord, and motor efferent, taking commands out. But now we have two new divisions, depending on where those commands are going. The somatic nervous system takes commands to skeletal muscle, voluntarily controlled, moving your body. The autonomic nervous system brings commands to cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands too, is involuntary, and you don't have any control over it. Okay, we've got one more big division. Our autonomic nervous system has two divisions. There is one called the parasympathetic division, nicknamed the rest and digest division. Then also one called the sympathetic division, nicknamed the fight or flight division. If you were running away from the snake, sympathetic activity would dominate. If you were just chilling, taking an afternoon nap, rest and digest would dominate. And we're actually going to spend a whole lot of time, a whole, like, unit going over the stuff, okay? So we're going to know this exists for right now. All right. Okay. Just to recap a little bit. Ah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Just to recap a little bit, we have a nervous system. The nervous system has a central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. The nervous system then has a peripheral nervous system, which is everything outside that, so all the nerves. And we divide it up into a sensory 
afferent division, a motor efferent division. The motor efferent division then gets a somatic nervous system and an autonomic nervous system. And that autonomic nervous system gets a parasympathetic branch and a sympathetic branch. So a lot of breakdown of the nervous system. We're going to go through a lot of this stuff. Let's do it. But before we get there, let's introduce ourselves to the two basic kinds of cells we're going to see in the brain, the spinal cord, nerves, etc., the two basic cells of nervous tissue are neurons, and you probably have, I don't know, 100 billion neurons or so, and then there's another cell called glial cells. Okay, quick, quick functions of these guys. Neurons are all about control and communication. This star-shaped guy right here this guy is a neuron. So he's got all these things sticking out of him. He is a neuron. Beautiful looking neuron. All the little guys in here are glial cells. So it's a glial cell right there. That's a glial cell right there. Glial cell right there. Glial cell right there. Glial cells are your supporting cells. And they, as this picture implies, they are a lot more numerous than neurons. Okay, these are our two basic types of cells in nervous tissue. Overall, what do neurons do? Now, I just said control and communicate. Well, let's break that down a little bit more. In terms of communicate, neurons are going to bring sensory information in. So neurons can send sensory information into your brain and spinal cord. Sensory input, that's one of the jobs of neurons. Neurons can also take signals out of your brain and spinal cord. Well, that's motor output. Neurons are also involved in the processing of information. Neurons will talk to each other a lot. They will process a lot of information. And our word for that information processing is integration. Okay, some functions of neurons there. Now, we're going to come back to neurons in a moment. We're going to take a little detour and meet the, full, the basic types of glial cells. There's actually a total of six types of glial cells. There are four that are in the central nervous system. So four central nervous system glial cells. That was supposed to be a line. There we go. Four central nervous system glial cells and two peripheral nervous system glial cells. We can actually see all of our four central nervous system glial cells in this picture. There are ones called astrocytes. There are ones called microglia. There are ones called oligodendrocytes. And there are ones called ependymal cells. Okay, so let's figure out what these four guys do. And this picture eh, gives a hint at some of their jobs. So maybe we'll come back to this picture. I don't know. So starting with astrocytes. Astrocytes are very much involved in maintaining the tissue fluid around neurons. Astrocytes are also involved in forming something called the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier, which is how we prevent bad stuff from in the blood from getting out and affecting our nervous tissue. So you can see this astrocyte has wrapped his feet around this blood vessel, helping form part of this blood-brain barrier. And astrocytes do other things as well. Microglia are kind of like the scavenger and immune cells of your central nervous system. They will engulf, so do some phagocytosis of microbes, of cellular debris, waste products, that sort of thing. So microglia are good at phagocytosis. They have a lot of arms, which we know if you have a lot of arms, you're better at grabbing and engulfing things. All right. 
Um, what else? The oligodendrocytes, yeah. Oligodendrocytes in the CNS help form a covering around the signaling component of a neuron. So here's a neuron right here. The neuron has this piece called an axon, which it uses to send electrical signals. Because it's sending electrical signals, we often want to insulate it. And the insulation in the CNS is done by these cells that are the oligodendrocytes. This is an oligodendrocyte. Here's an oligodendrocyte right here. Oligodendrocytes stick out these arms, and the arms almost wrap around. You can see it, it's, it's doing it right here. It's wrapping around the axon, the electrical signaling part of a neuron. This insulation that is formed by oligodendrocytes in the CNS is called the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath. Okay. Oligo means like some or a few. Dendro means armed. So it's the some arms, a cell with some arms. And those arms stick out and those arms wrap around axons. We'll talk more about axons later on. Don't worry. Okay, what do we, what do we got going on here? This is a brain over here. This is a brain right here. And this is a spinal cord cut and cross section. The blue and the gray, green in this brain are actually these cavities in the brain called ventricles. So your brain has these cavities called ventricles. And they're, they're not tiny. They're not like huge, but they're not tiny. Your spinal cord has a cavity in the center right there. And that cavity is called the central canal. You also have a space around your brain and spinal cord that we'll meet a little bit later, but we'll introduce it now, called the subarachnoid, subarachnoid space. These three spaces, the subarachnoid space, the central canal in the middle of the spinal cord, the ventricles in your brain are all filled with fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. So like brain spinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Okay, the CSF needs to be circulated through these places. So, these are ependymal cells right here. These are ependymal cells right here. And I want you to look at what the ependymal cells have. Let's get some more arrows. What are these guys? What do these guys look like to you? They should look familiar. Think back to the trachea, maybe. What do these guys look like? Those are cilia. Hopefully you were thinking cilia. And what does cilia do? Cilia are going to sweep. And the sweeping cilia of ependymal cells is going to move cerebral spinal fluid through the subarachnoid space, through the central canal, through the ventricles. This is an important circulation that has to happen. So ependymal cells are going to be lining these um, these ventricles, they're going to be lining the central canal. They're going to be sweeping this cerebrospinal fluid. All right. So that, I think, is it. Did we do all four? Yeah, we did axons. We did, sorry, astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, and ependymal cells. Okay, just checking my count there. Now, in the peripheral nervous system, we have two types of glial cells. By the, word, by the way, the word glia means glue. So, 
kind of like the supporting glue of the nervous system. Glial cells in the peripheral nervous system are of two varieties. There are cells called Schwann cells. Here's a Schwann cell right here. All these guys are Schwann cells. Schwann cell is like the old-fashioned name for it. They're also called neurolemocytes. You can use either one. It's all good. So the Schwann cells and neurolemocytes, what they are going to do, and you can kind of see this here, they are going to form the insulation on a neuron's axon, its electrical signaling component, but they're doing it outside of the brain and spinal cord. They're doing it in the PNS. So Schwann cells are doing the same thing. They're making the myelin sheath. They're making the myelin sheath just like the oligodendrocytes did in the CNS. Now, neurolemocytes are not the only PNS glial cell. There are also these cells called satellite cells. And one of their major jobs is to maintain the tissue fluid around neurons in your peripheral nervous system. And they do other things as well. Okay. We got our glial cells, which is outstanding and excellent. I am happy about that. Oh, here we see a, a neurolemocyte, a Schwann cell, and the way it is wrapping around an axon. It does it in a slightly different fashion than an oligodendrocyte uses. So the oligodendrocyte had these arms raised out and wrapped around the axon, but the Schwann cell just does like the whole cell wraps around it. All right, and we'll talk about why this is important later on. But with that, let's talk about neurons. Here is a prototypical neuron right here. A neuron is a cell that has several long processes. Okay, the neuron is a cell with several long processes. The neuron typically has a cell body. The cell body is also known as the soma. Remember the word soma just means body. And so we got a nucleus in there. We got other stuff in there as well. And then coming out of that cell body, we have processes, two major types of processes, dendrites and axon. Okay, let's figure out what these three parts, the soma, the dendrites, and the axon, let's figure out what they really do. All right, the soma is like just where all the main cellular stuff is going to happen. You've got the nucleus, so you've got the DNA, you've got the production of proteins, you've got a lot of mitochondria for energy, you have an endoplasmic reticulum for making proteins, the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER, in the neuron is called the Nissel body. You also have neurofibrils which are going to be proteins to help maintain the structure of the neuron. So remember, in a neuron body, there are the three major ends you have to know, the neurofibrils, the nissel body, and the nucleus. Okay. What's next? Where do we keep most of our cell bodies? Well, most of our cell bodies of our neurons are actually going to be found in our brain and in our spinal cord. Most of the time, it's the processes that you find going out into parts of your body. So we keep most of our cell bodies, most of our somata, so the plural for the word soma is somata, They're, most of them are in the brain. And they're important. So we protect them with this beautiful skull of ours. Now, something else is very important that happens in the cell bodies of neurons, and it is that I word we had earlier where we process information. That processing information in neurons is known as integration. So integration happens in our cell bodies, our somata, of our neurons, we keep most of our neurons in our somata of our neurons, 
protected in our brain and our spinal cord. All right. We actually have a name for when we have clusters of somata in the central nervous system. This is a slice of the brain. This is a coronal slice of the brain, so a frontal section of the brain. And what I can see in here are things like this, these deep chunks of darker tissue. That is called a nucleus right there. All right, that is called a nucleus. This is a nucleus over here. A nucleus is a collection of neuron cell bodies in the central nervous system. Nuclei are sites of integration. Now, I know we, this is the sort of thing we do in anatomy and physiology. We use uh, the, a word we had earlier, now we're giving it a whole different meaning. So the word nucleus has several meanings, right? The you could have a nucleus of an atom where you have the protons and the neutrons. You could have a nucleus inside a cell where you find the DNA. And now we have a nucleus in our brain which is a collection of neuron cell bodies. Now you might wonder, if there's collections of cell bodies in the CNS, are there also collections of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system? Well, yeah, there are. So here's our spinal cord, right? There's a spinal cord. And so we got nerves coming out of the spinal cord here. And this guy right here, is actually a collection of cell bodies. Got a bunch of them here. A collection of neuron cell bodies doing integration, but outside the spinal cord in the brain. So in other words, in the peripheral nervous system, that is known as a ganglion. A ganglion. I see, I put green circles around for ganglia. The plural of ganglion is ganglia. Okay, so our neurons have cell bodies where they do most of their normal cellular stuff, plus they also process information, in other words, integration. The cell bodies, the somata, are often clustered together. In the central nervous system, we call such a cluster a nucleus. In the peripheral nervous system, we call such a cluster a ganglion. Okay. Let's keep going. All right. We're now going to talk about some of the processes that come off of the cell body. So normally, a neuron cell body has multiple branching dendrites. These guys are all dendrites. The word dendro, the prefix dendro means tree. So because of their branching. Now, Dendrites are going to receive signals from other neurons or sensory organs. So dendrites are like the receptive part of our neuron where information comes to the neuron. Dendrites branch so they have more surface area so they can get more signals from other neurons and sensory cells. Now, dendrites then send their own electrical signals. So dendrites will send their own electrical signals down, their, down themselves towards the cell body, towards the axon. And the signals, the electrical signals used by a dendrite are known as graded potentials. So a neuron usually has many branching processes called dendrites coming out of its cell body. There are many of them, and they branch quite a bit. That gives us a lot of surface area. This is good because their job is to be receptive to receive signals from other neurons or sensory organs. In fact, the word dendro means branching like a tree, so it makes sense. Now, dendrites, have to, if they're getting signals, you have to then send that information. And they're going to send that information with these special types of electrical signals called graded potentials. Okay, we got one more neuron part to do. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, the final part of the neuron 
is the axon. The axon is this single solitary structure emanating from the cell body. Notice that the axon is often myelinated. We see Schwann cells around it. The job of the axon is to get electrical signals coming from the dendrite and cell body and then to send electrical signals called action potentials down the axon and the arrival of these action potentials at the tips of the axon, the tips are called the axon terminals, it's going to prompt those axon terminals to release chemical signals called neurotransmitters onto another neighboring neuron or an effector cell, like a muscle cell. So, backtracking here, axons are usually signal, they come out of the cell body, they extend onward. Axons are going to get electrical signals from the dendrites and soma, and those signals are called graded potentials. Axons are then going to send their own electrical signals, called action potentials, and they send them all the way to the very end, and the tips of the axon are called the axon terminals, and in response to those electrical signals, the axon terminals release chemicals called neurotransmitters, which will stimulate a neighboring neuron, or an effector cell like a muscle cell. Now there is, there are some terminology, there is some terminology, there are some words we have to know associated with the axon. First of all, the axon begins as like a cone and then it gradually tapers. So it begins as a cone and it gradually tapers. And that cone shaped beginning region is called the axon hillock. The word hillock means like a small hill. Not sure why they chose it, but hey, what are you going to do? The axon then goes out. Sometimes the axon has big branches. If it has big branches, they are called axon collaterals. I don't see any big branches on this guy. Every axon is going to have multiple tiny branches at its end. Those tiny branches are called telodendria. Telo means at the end. Dendria means branches. Each telodendrion will have an axon terminal, also known as a synaptic knob, and that is going to be full of neurotransmitters waiting to be released. Now, not every axon is myelinated, but this one is. I see multiple Schwann cells around this axon which tells me I must be dealing with a peripheral nervous system axon, and the Schwann cells are going to insulate the axon. But notice that there are little gaps in between Schwann cells where we can see the axon, little gaps in there, and those little gaps are known as nodes of Ranvier. And the nodes of Ranvier will be important later when we talk about how the signal actually travels down the axon. Okay. Neurons typically have a cell body, many branching dendrites to receive signals, receive information, usually a single axon to send a command onward. All right. Good stuff. Let's talk a little more. So we've kind of hinted at this already, but neurons are going to communicate with one another. So what I have here is the soma of a, of a neuron. I'm going to write the word soma on the soma of this neuron. And I want you to look at this dendrite right here. This is a dendrite. We see him branching. He is a dendrite. And I'm just going to write denda. And right here, look right here. I have an axon terminal from another axon, so a different neuron's axon is this green guy here. This other neuron's axon, you can see his Schwann cells, his nodes of Ranvier, telodendria, and axon terminals. And this axon terminal is like microscopically close to that dendrite, so that when electrical signals come down this axon, we can then release chemical signals from the axon terminal onto that neighboring dendrite. And this junction between two neurons, like we have in this case, or it could be between neurons and an effector cell, like a muscle cell, 
That is called a synapse. A synapse. Synapses are where neurons talk to other neurons. Synapses are amazingly important. You actually make new synapses when you are learning new stuff, which is pretty incredible. And I see synapses happening between an axon and a cell body, right here, between an axon and another axon right here, and like we originally started with, the axon and the dendrites. Okay. So a synapse is a junction between two neurons or a neuron and a effector cell. Because we know the axon terminal is going to release neurotransmitters onto a neighboring neuron, and that junction where that occurs is called a synapse. So there is a lot of vocabulary that we are doing here. Oh, and we got to zoom in up close to the synapse here. Let's start with the big picture here. Here's, here's a neuron cell body right here. And we've got another neuron's axon right here. If it's myelination, it's Schwann cells. And we're zooming in on this telodendrion right here, this branch of an axon coming on down. And then this whole guy right here is the axon terminal. You can see the axon terminal is filled with these little green guys. These are neurotransmitters. So when the electrical signal comes down this axon, it prompts these vesicles here, they're called synaptic vesicles, to undergo exocytosis. And these neurotransmitters are released and they bind to the neighboring cell, which is pretty neat. Notice they called the neuron releasing the neurotransmitter is the presynaptic, and the neuron receiving the neurotransmitter is the postsynaptic. And this junction right here is the synapse. The space, the space right here even has its own name. That space is called the synaptic cleft. That space is called the synaptic cleft. All right. Like I was saying earlier, a lot of vocabulary here. I encourage you to go through this video like twice at least. Try and get a handle on all this vocab before you move on. Okay. Just backtracking a little bit. All right, we're doing good. We're doing good. We're going to do a couple more things right now. Just a few more things. Um, we can now classify neurons structurally based on how their dendrites and axons look. And that structural classification is threefold. There are multipolar neurons, bipolar neurons, and unipolar neurons. All right, which one do you think is the bipolar neuron of these three? Which one do you think is bipolar? Got a guess? Did you guess this one? Yeah, it's the bipolar neuron. Which one is this guy over here? What do you think? This guy must be the unipolar neuron, and this guy over here is going to be the multipolar neuron. Okay. Fantastic. Let's talk about them. Starting with multipolar neurons. Multipolar neurons are what we've been looking at today already. This is a multipolar neuron right here. A multipolar neuron is going to have a cell body. So here is the cell body. You can see the nucleus in there. You can see the initial body. There are also neurofibrils in there as well. We can see all these dendrites out here. Dendrites are branching, so they can receive signals from other neurons or sensory organs. Dendrites send signals to the soma called graded potentials. The soma sends graded potentials onward towards the axon. So our axon is starting right here with the axon hillock, right there. There's the axon hillock. Our axon proceeds all the way down. We see some telodendria at the end and some axon terminals which are chock full of neurotransmitters. 
and ready to form a synapse with another neuron. We got Schwann cells here forming the myelin sheath, and we see the space in between them, which is the, which is a node of Renvier. So as a multipolar neuron, the one we dealt with already is a multipolar neuron. I want to say 99% of your neurons in your body are multipolar neurons. It is the most common type of neuron we're going to have. All right. Let's clear all that. Junk. There we go. Here's a bipolar neuron. It's got a cell body, soma right there, a relatively normal axon coming out of it, telodendria, axon terminals at the end. The dendrite's weird, though. It's like the dendrite does all its branching over towards one end, then all the dendrite branches fuse together into a single structure that goes away towards the cell body, as opposed to having lots of dendrites going into the separately into the cell body. So bipolar, bi is going to be two, so polar is like different ends here, two different ends, one with the dendrite, one with the axon. Now bipolar neurons are found in two places. They're found in the back of our eye, the retina of the eye. Maybe you know a little bit about the retina of your eye. It is going to be the light sensing part of your eye in the back of your eye. So you go to the eye doctor, she dilates you, and then looks through your dilated pupil to see your retina. Because it's important to check it out in your annual eye exam. Now, there are rows of cells in the retina, including the rods and the cones that actually are going to be stimulated by light. But then from those rods and cones, they're stimulated by light, cells are going to transfer information. And there are neurons in that information path that are bipolar. And we can see these reddish guys here. These reddish guys here are bipolar cells in our retina of our eye. So there's one place we are going to find bipolar neurons. Another place is not that far away, but in your nodes. In the superior nasal cavity, you have this olfactory epithelium. So in the superior nasal cavity, you've got this olfactory epithelium up here. Remember, olfactory means for smelling. And in that olfactory epithelium, check out these yellow guys here. These are bipolar cells involved in sending information about smell up towards your brain. If you look, there's lots of good stuff in this picture here. You guys know what this is right here? That is your frontal sinus. Here's your sphenoid sinus. Here is your maxillary bone with its alveolar process. Maxillary bone with its palatine process. Here's the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Inferior nasal concha, middle nasal concha, superior nasal concha hiding up there. All pretty good stuff. Here is your atlas right here sitting near your sphenoid bone. And we're zooming in on the ethmoid bone. We're zooming in on the cribriform plate. And we can see a olfactory foramen right here. There's another one right there. So involved in that sense of smell, we have bipolar cells. So bipolar neurons are only found in two places. They're found in your olfactory epithelium and in your retina. So not nearly as common as the multipolar cells we dealt with a moment ago. Okay, lastly, unipolar neurons. They got a cell body, and they have one sticky out piece, which is kind of weird. All right, and if we, let's start on this end over here. On this end over here, we've got the dendrites, and the dendrites are fusing together, but instead of the dendrites going to the cell body, the dendrites fuse together and actually form the axon right here. Then the axon goes all the way to the uh, to its other end, passing the cell body along the way. So it's like the cell body doesn't get the electrical signal. 
is not part of the pathway the way it was in the other types of neurons. So dendrites fuse together to form the axon. The first part of the axon is called the peripheral process until we get to the cell body. And then we have the central process going after that. Now, the neurons of this type are sensory neurons. So neurons involved in things like, like touch, sensation of temperature, sensation of uh, proprioception in your joints and limbs. Those sensory neurons in your body are unipolar neurons. And if you think about it, the central process here is going towards the central nervous system. The peripheral process is coming from the peripheral nervous system. So we're going to see these guys when we look at sensory neurons, especially when we look at how sensory neurons get into the spinal cord. We have to remember the fact that these guys are unipolar neurons and they have this weird situation with the cell body kind of like off to the side. Okay, here we have one. Here is a sensory neuron right here. Here it's cell body right there. Here's its dendrites. Axon coming in, going past the cell body, onward into the spinal cord where the axon terminals will be found. Notice this sensory neuron is coming into the back of the spinal cord. This is the back of the spinal cord. Notice how the word afferent was used here because we have a sensory neuron going in. Notice how the cell body is found in a cluster, a swelling here where there would be other cell bodies, so it is called a ganglion. Notice how the motor neuron over here, the one sending commands to a skeletal muscle, for example, is a standard multipolar neuron coming out of the ventral side. And we use the word efferent to describe it. So we're getting some stuff we met earlier here. All right. Last thing we're going to do, this slide right here is the last one because this lecture is getting long. We can also classify our neurons functionally, and we've kind of done this already. We are going to have three basic classes. Sensory neurons, the blue guy right here. Motor neurons, the red guy right here. And interneurons, in between them. Sensory neurons bring information into the cord. Motor neurons take commands out. Interneurons are in between. Interneurons are all about integration. Now, which of these three do you think is the most common in your body? You got a guess for me? Well, the answer is interneurons, which should make sense. I mean, think about it. Think about how good we are at thinking, at processing information. Well, that's the job of interneurons. So it makes sense that we have so many of these. All right, guys, we are going to end it right here. This is a great first nervous system lecture. I encourage you to watch it twice. We get into the fun stuff next time. All right, we're like, we're kind of done like all the anatomy for this particular um, slide set. We're done with all the anatomy. We really just have to now talk about how neurons actually generate electrical signals and communicate. So review that anatomy again. Maybe watch this stuff twice. Start making those flashcards. And I will see you all next time. Bye-bye.